Okay, good afternoon and welcome to our second round of SNED Talks, Sati Nikuchi Educational Talks. <laughs> we really, really appreciate you all being here. It's obvious that every person counts, every person who came to support adult ed at the center. We want to express our gratitude at this time for not only you, but for the spirit of Isabel Lumsden Couch. We did this last time, and if, if we, anytime we have SNED talks, I think the committee just feels strongly we want to acknowledge Isabel's wonderful contribution to education. Now, is there anyone here who hasn't been to the center before? I know almost everyone here. Okay. Um, for your benefit, I'll tell you that there's an exit, the back of the auditorium, another one at the side. We always have to say these things. You know, the men's restrooms are at the, at the end of the hall to your left, and the women's at the end of the hall on your right. Uh, please turn off your cell phones, and please don't take pictures or videos during the program. I'm also told to say that. <laughs> we want to thank Linda Harding and Vicki McMurrah so much for lights, sound, and visual aids. So much. Sam Williams for design and layout of the programs. Roger Williams for creating a video record of our SNED Talks. And Dee Dee Boat, who graciously coordinates our adult ed committee efforts, even though we are not part of her job description. <laughs> And I want to thank our wonderful, wonderful adult ed committee for their great work. They say not to name them, but I'm sorry, I'm going to this time. <laughs> and they'll just, if you want to be mad at me, okay. But Anne Gillespie, Tony Reed, and Barbara Williams. Um, just <laughs> okay, so we're going to hear three interesting talks by our volunteer speakers who have are rising to a, a challenge today to do this and we will give you a chance to ask a few questions after each talk then there'll be time for informal talk and refreshments and refreshments in the curriculum room next door afterward so our first speaker is Mike Coleman known to many of you as entertainer par excellence Mike loves musical theater and is a writer by profession so he combines two great passions of his in talking to us about Stephen Sondheim's lyrics. Sorry about that. <laughs> Mike's on? Yeah. Yes. One, two, three, baby, don't think twice. Just like that, you got a brand new life. Hop in this truck and run through the red lights. <laughs> Stephen Sondheim did not write that. <laughs> it's not the subject matter so much as the way it is written that raises the red flag. This is not a Sondheim lyric. Actually, it took three guys to write this 2011 hit by uh, Keith Urban. Go figure. <laughs> Here's another example of lyric writing. 1970, the musical company opens on Broadway. In the song, You Could Drive a Person Crazy, three young ladies voice their frustration over a bachelor they find attractive but infuriatingly aloof. When a certain personality is personable, he shouldn't ought to sit like a lump. It's harder than a matador coercing a bull to try to get you off of your rump. <laughs> now you're talking. That's a Sondheim lyric. I mean, he rhymed personable with coercionable. Come on. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the world of Stephen Sondheim, one of our greatest composers and lyricists. I'll be your tour guide for the next 15 minutes. How many of you are already Sondheim fans? Oh, great. I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. How many might know Send in the Clowns, but not much more? Well, there is so much to know about Stephen Sondheim. 
I've been a fan for 45 years, and I'm still learning. He rose to prominence as the writer of the lyrics for the musicals West Side Story and for Gypsy in the 1950s. In the decades that followed, he went on to write the lyrics and the music for a string of successful musicals, Company, A Little Night Music, Sweeney Todd, to name a few. Today, I'm going to talk about why Sondheim is great. Oh, sure, there are the awards, the Tonys, a Grammy, an Oscar, a Pulitzer Prize, and yes, even the Presidential Medal of Freedom. But all you really need to do is listen to a Sondheim song to understand why all the accolades. Today, I'm going to concentrate just on Sondheim's lyrics, why they set a certain standard, why they build on the great theater composers, Irving Berlin, Dorothy Fields, Frank Lesser, and go them one better, why they show us what we all should expect from our songwriters, not just theater songs, but popular songs too, and why, with apologies to Keith Urban, rhyming twice, life, and lights just isn't good enough. <laughs> To illustrate my point, I'm going to talk about one Sondheim song, one that's put together as neatly as a Jenga puzzle, you know, those wooden tower things. It's truly a wonder to behold. Every time you dig into it, you find something new. But first, let's take a look at Sondheim's philosophy on lyric writing. He believes that in combining words and music for maximum impact, Sometimes less is more. To illustrate, he offers this example of some familiar lyrics from Oklahoma, from the song, Oh, What a Beautiful Morning. Now, Sondheim did not write this musical, of course. Uh, the lyrics for Oklahoma were, writ were written by Oscar Hammerstein, who was Sondheim's neighbor when he was growing up, and later became his friend and his mentor in later years. Sondheim says in theatrical fact that it is usually the plainer and flatter lyric that soars poetically when infused with music. Music straightjackets a poem, Sondheim writes, and prevents it from breathing on its own, whereas it liberates a lyric. Isn't that great? Poetry, he says, does not need music. Lyrics do. So let's try it. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I've got a beautiful feeling. Everything's going my way. Now let's sing it. Please join me on this one. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I've got a beautiful feeling. Everything's going my way. It makes a difference, doesn't it? And that was beautiful, by the way. <laughs> Sondheim has strong opinions about the use of rhyme in lyrics, too. Let's listen to the quartet, Love Will See Us Through, You're Gonna Love Tomorrow, from Sondheim's 1971 musical, Follies. Now, Follies, even though it's billed as a musical comedy, is not all sunshine and roses. It's about two unhappily married couples who meet at a reunion in a crumbling theater where the wives were Ziegfeld showgirls in their younger days. The younger versions of the two couples appear on stage from time to time with the main characters and actually interact with them in a pastiche form imitating the Ziegfeld Folly style. The younger couples sing about happy days naively revealing their hopeful and as yet unsullied view of marriage. Phyllis and Ben, one of the young couples, sing the first half. What will tomorrow bring upon the weary? Will it be cheery? Will it be sad? Oh, no. 
up tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You're gonna be with me. Mm -hmm. You're gonna love tomorrow. I'm giving you a personal guarantee. Things will move to sorrow. Mm -hmm. And very well I'll be. Bye bye. The inner rhymes here, words that rhyme within a line rather than just at the ending, are one of the things that make this typically Sondheim lyric future and suitier, and then blue chip carrying an echo of the rhyme into the next phrase. Inna and synonym, that's another hidden gem in this piece. And then there is the hilarious rhyming of Deary and Cheery with the starkly contrasting Harakiri. <laughs> of this, Sondheim says, rhymes whose endings are spelled differently, for example, rougher and suffer, are more interesting than those which are spelled the same, rougher and tougher, not only to the eye, but to the ear, perhaps because the brain subliminally sees them in print and is more surprised when they come along. One other distinguishing feature of this song, Sondheim says the best songs end with a joke, and by that he doesn't mean a laugh necessarily, but a line that wraps up the song with an ironic punch. Here, tomorrow's what you're gonna have a lifetime of with me, can be read two ways, as a promise, or a threat, right? <laughs> Especially since the audience knows that this particular marriage is not a happy one in its later years, the line casts a shadow over the sunny lyrics, and that is precisely Sondheim's intent. Let's listen now to the second half of the song. It's sung by the other couple, Sally and Buddy. Phyllis and Ben join them for the ending. The queer man and wife, I will do wonders to make your life so stirring and free of care. Sondheim is not completely happy with that one. 
The rhyme is not perfect, he writes. The equal accents on soul and stir don't quite match the heavy accent on bowl and the lighter one on stir. But, he says, I tried to mask that by leaping the melody up as each ing, on each ing to distract the ear. So that would be bolstering, soul stirring. There's still a little bit of a difference there, but he's, he's admitting that he tried to disguise it. He says, imperfect it is, yes, but as far as I know, it's unique. And it's been waiting all this time to be unearthed. Another internal rhyme I love is Warn You and Cornucopia. Sondheim could have written it differently. He could have said, I have some traits I warn you, to which you'll have objections. I too have a lot of silly traits and imperfections. It's not as funny, is it? Nor as intricate or interesting. There is irony here too. Young Sally is being facetious when she talks about her cornucopia of imperfections. She's not really serious. But at the point in the musical where this song comes, the drama is all about the older Sally's imperfections, namely that she's in love with another man, Ben. Whammo. Again, Sondheim adds dramatic power and dimension to what otherwise would be a pleasant two-dimensional song. So we've studied one Sondheim song. We've seen some of the elements that distinguish his work. Here are the big three, in my humble opinion. Sondheim songs are not easy to lift from their shows and turn into top 40 hits. Most of them are tightly woven into the fabric of the show itself, specific to its plot and its characters. It's why Send in the Clowns is the only Sondheim song that I'm aware of, anyway, to make the popular charts when Judy Collins recorded it in the 1970s. Number two, Sondheim's vocabulary. How often do you hear soul-stirring, bolstering, cornucopia in a song? In Sweeney Todd, he also does wonders with comeuppance, proclivities, and coriander. <laughs> Number three, Sondheim is an advocate of true or perfect rhymes. He defines these as rhymes consisting of two words or phrases whose final accented syllables sound alike, except for the consonant sounds which precede them, folks and jokes, for example, personable, coarsenable. Near or false rhymes, on the other hand, are rhymes in which the vowel sounds are alike, but the subsequent consonants are different, as in our Keith Urban example, twice, life, lights, Sondheim calls them lazy rhymes. In his book, Finishing the Hat, Sondheim quotes one popular songwriter who had a hit on Broadway. In the book, Sondheim refers to him as X, but I'm willing to bet it's Elton John. He quotes X as saying, I'm not a great believer in perfect rhymes. I'm just a believer in feelings that come across. If the craft gets in the way of the feelings, then I'll take the feelings any day. I don't sit with a rhyming dictionary. Well, my response to Sir Elton would be that he wouldn't have found Warn You and Cornucopia in a rhyming dictionary anyway, <laughs> but that's just me. Sondheim goes a little deeper. He says, the point which X overlooks is that the craft is supposed to serve the feeling, not the other way around. A perfect rhyme can make a mediocre line bright and a good one brilliant. A near rhyme dampens the impact. His conclusion, the more random and imprecise, the more writing becomes blather, a letter to the editor, not art. And art is what we're talking about when we talk about Stephen Sondheim. Sure, there are good composers working in musical theater today. William Finn, Lisa Crone, Lin-Manuel Miranda, whose musical Hamilton brought the complex rhyming architecture of hip-hop to the Broadway stage. Yet lazy rhymes are seeping more and more frequently into Broadway scores. 
is Sondheim's craftsmanship a thing of the past? Are we content to say that like Mozart, he was a genius and there'll never be another one like him? I hope we don't have to settle for that. As long as there is Sondheim, who thankfully at 82 or 83 now, is alive and well and writing another musical, as long as composers and lyricists work hard to follow his example, and as long as listeners like us demand the best, maybe the art, not the blather, will survive. Thank you. Do we have for Mike? I can't see y'all very well. Well, that's better. <laughs> <laughs> A little better. Well, I'll start out then. I always have questions. Is, is Sondheim unusual in being his own lyricist? You know, mostly you hear I think so. of King. Yes, it's usually a team, most commonly. So you don't know of anyone else? Rogers and Hammerstein, right. who, who are able to do both. It's pretty rare. And for many years, I think with the first musical, where he wrote both the lyrics and the music, there was a lot of doubt whether he could actually pull it off. Uh -huh. And he did, yeah. and continues to. Mike, was that first musical the first one that was actually on stage, or was there anything that preceded it, any lyrics, music preceded that, how did he begin, I guess I'm asking really. I'm sorry, you mean Follies, or? How did he begin? How did he begin prior to his getting into musical work, writing musicals? How did his career begin? I think he was inspired by Oscar Hammerstein, who had a, a strong influence on him. He knew him when he was growing up, and uh, I think he had a friendship also with Leonard Bernstein, and so it just sort of grew out of those relationships as something that he always wanted to do. What did his parents do that that was, those were his neighbor's friends? I don't know. I think they were wealthy, but I, I don't know what they did. Anything else? Yeah, my favorite is the end of the woods, and I wondered if you had any comments on that. I think some of the lines in that brought out as they were, and she's climbing the stairs or something, mm -hmm. and there'll be a long pause, and then she'll add another line, or he'll add another line, and uh, I find it pure genius. The whole it is, and I think even with what Sondheim said about less is more, he does tend to like to show off occasionally. <laughs> And I, I think he shows off a lot in the lyrics in Into the Woods. And it's interesting to me, too, how uh, the show struggled when it first opened in the 80s on Broadway. People didn't get it. It didn't get great reviews when it came out. But the popularity of it just continues to build. It's interesting. Okay. Thank you. Mike. Welcome, Karen. Karen's passion for using and teaching about essential oils is an expression of both her spirituality and her interest in ancient history. Good afternoon. Egyptians, Chinese, Hebrews, Indians, Europeans, Greeks, and Romans all have in common. Each culture I just mentioned were very familiar with essential oils and the many ways in which they were used. You know, modern day folk may think that essential oils are relatively a new thing, but in fact, they have been around since the beginning of time. The word essential 
comes from the root word essence, or life force. The appeal of essential oils is that they are extracted from the natural life force of flowers, leaves, barks, or barks and roots of plants. The ancients knew this because essential oils were a part of their everyday lives. In the Egyptian culture, essential oils were applied to the embalming purposes of the dead. And the reason we know this is because essential oils, the residue from these oils, were found in the tombs dating back over 2,000 years ago. Now, within the Egyptian cultures, essential oils were so valued that the great ones would gather barrels of the most expensive and rarest of oils and have them buried as part of their treasure store for the next world. Now, as a consequence, the ancient grave robbers of that day would steal the barrels of the essential oils even before the gold and silver because they were considered to be of much more value. In the story of Esther in the Bible, it is told that the king of Persia was seeking a new queen. Now, women were brought from many countries, and they were brought to the royal household for presentation to the king, and they were prepared for him for a period of six months to a year of beauty treatments. Sandalwood and myrrh was used to make their skin soft and fragrant and subtle. Now, it's assumed that the use of essential oils for the women as they were being exposed to it was specifically for the enhancement of beautification. However, there may have been another reason for doing so. You see, with so many women being presented to the king from various foreign regions and cultures, there was a risk that exposure to germs and disease would be of concern. And so it was for that reason that an application of specifically selected pure essential oils would reduce, if not totally eliminate, the, the threat that the king would be exposed to anything that would cause him ill health or harm. At the birth of the Christ child, the Magi brought gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. The two gifts of essential oils were of extreme value, and that was comparable to giving the Holy Family an all-inclusive medicine chest. Frankincense, which is also known as the king of the oils, was used for healing the damage to the body brought on by childbirth not just for the mother, but for the child as well. And it also afforded protection from disease and germs, as well as just for everyday cuts and abrasions. Ancient customs also employed the use of essential oils in ritual anointings. Kings and queens are anointed with essential oil at their coronations. Roman soldiers would often anoint their, or their shields and their swords with the essential oils to instill courage in combat. Old Testament prophets and Jewish priests anointed marriage beds and livestock, newborns, and property for a variety of reasons. Their selected choice was of frankincense and myrrh, but also the sacred oil blend that was produced exclusively in their holy place of worship. Ancient cultures often used the application of essential oils as an act of hospitality. You see, since there were no inside baths or showers in most homes during those days, a practical way for a host to welcome his guest or her guest would be to anoint their head and their feet with essential oils. Now, not only was this a pleasant and honoring custom for the weary traveler of that day, but it was also an ideal way to disguise the sweat and other unpleasant body odors for the rest of the family. <laughs> now, for centuries, the bubonic plague decimated populations of Asia and Europe. And it was from this period of history that a legend was born of four thieves who were robbing the dead and dying victims of the plague. And once they were caught, the magistrate did offer some leniency, but only if they were able to divulge how they were able to carry out these gruesome acts without being exposed to the plague. They did confess to the magistrate that they procured a concoction of essential oils from some exotic spice traders who had instructed them to put the oils inside the other nostrils, a couple of drops on a bandana-style mask, and a couple of drops on their clothes. By doing this, using this antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral oil, they were protected from contagion. The mysterious oil blend that is said to have been a mixture of is some kind of essential oil, either orange or lemon, 
with clove and cinnamon, eucalyptus, and rosemary. We might want to keep that in mind during flu season. But are essential oils effective enough for the needs of our modern day families? Well, the answer to that is a resounding yes. Essential oils have found their place into our sophisticated world quite well, and they are here to stay. Now, there are three ways you can incorporate essential oils into your daily day to day, day life. Aromatically, topically, and internally. Aromatically, you can diffuse essential oils, and it will do several things. It will clean the air from impurities. It will enhance the mood and freshen and fragrance the air in your homes, your offices, and in your automobiles. If you are diffusing lavender, for instance, that will promote a sense of calming and relaxing ambiance. If you are diffusing peppermint or rosemary eucalyptus, and you're doing it during bedtime hours, that's going to make, help make your breathing easier throughout the night. Now, the most popular way to diffuse oils is through a nebulizing diffuser. These oil diffusers will combine essential oil with water and will send a steady or an intermittent flow of mist into the air that is breathed in while you're enjoying the fragrance and aroma of your favorite oil or an oil blend. When it's diffused in this manner, the molecules of the, of the oils remain suspended in the air for several hours to freshen and improve the quality of the air you're breathing. Don't have a diffuser? Well, that's okay. Just put a couple of drops of essential oils in the palm of your hand, rub them together, and just simply breathe in. Just be careful not to get it too close to your eyes. Topically, most um, oils can be applied directly to the bottoms of the feet, over the heart and stomach, on the temples of the forehead, or on the neck and the shoulders. Now, the exception to this are oils like cassia or cinnamon, clove, oregano, or thyme. They're considered to be a little bit more warm and hot oils, so you will want to dilute that with a carrier oil like fractionated coconut oil just to keep your sensitivity from skin if your skin gets sensitive to that kind of thing. And because essential oils are so potent, it's re important to remember that more is not necessarily better. One or two drops is all you really ever need. Now, one of the reasons essential oils are so powerful and effective is attributed to the fact that the oil's molecular structure is so minute it is able to penetrate down to your body's cellular level and even past the blood-brain barrier. The bottoms of the feet, of course, are the fastest area to absorb the oils because the pores are larger in that area. But the wrists and behind the ears are also fast absorbing areas of the way as well. Now, essential oils are becoming more prevalent in therapeutic programs where um, touch and aromatic diffusion is becoming more widely accepted and practiced. In advanced recovery programs that include supervised aromatherapy and aroma touch therapy with essential oils, programs that work with survivors of trauma from physical abuse or human sex trafficking, soldiers returning from combat with PTSD, first responders and policemen with, uh, suffering from PTSD, and also animal abuse cases are showing significant reduction in stress and anxiety levels, as well as increased trust levels while they are participating in these programs. I've witnessed firsthand several of these programs in action, and it is really astonishing to see how subtly that these oils can affect the emotional, and subconscious level, levels of our human psyche. As a creative director for the Heart Dance Foundation, I was given an opportunity to create and implement a one-day faith-based program for survivors of human sex trafficking. Now, in our previous retreats, um, the day could be three quarters over before the ladies would even begin to start to relax even just a little. But when we incorporated the essential oils into the spa day retreat program, the results were much more than remarkable. We diffused these oil blends in each spa station and used the aroma touch therapy with the essential oils. Without even being aware of it, the ladies were able to relax and open up within minutes. They remained engaged and um, within the retreat and excited about it for the rest of the day. And I attribute the success of that and other programs 
to the incredible and healing, soothing properties of the life force of these oils. Now, the third way that you can use essential oils is internally. Oils can be placed under the tongue or on the roof of the mouth. Oils can be placed in little veggie capsules and swallowed as any other oral application would. Another favorite way to take oils is simply by adding them to a beverage. Cooking with essential oils can add extra flavor and spice to your favorite dishes, and they're a delicious substitute for dry herbs and spices. They last, they last way, way longer, and they go a lot, lot farther. If you ever wanted to make your own personal brand of good flavored cooking and seasoning oil at a fraction of cost, well, it's simple. All you have to do is add pure essential oil of rosemary, thyme, basil, oregano, fennel, majoram, or even a combination of those two instead of using the actual herbs. My personal favorite blend is rosemary and thyme. It is excellent for cooking and seasoning, and it also makes a delicious bread dipping oil. Now here are a few more ways that you can use essential oils. You can make your own green cleaning products and beauty products. You will save a bundle, and they work many times much better than the store bought products do. Most recipes are uncomplicated, quick, and easy. And as you can see, my sweet little Annabelle Lee loves it that I make her personal little kitty litter deodorant with a simple blend of baking soda and lavender essential oil. <laughs> That's not really her, but it's <laughs> She does leave me little heart things, though. Uh, <laughs> uh, so room fresheners, too, you can make that. Uh, it's very inexpensive. Just use distilled water and the oil of your choice in a glass spray bottle, and that's all you'll need. There really are truly so many ways you can enjoy essential oils, and the Internet, of course, has an abundant supply of recipes, new ideas, blogs, and resources that keep you well-informed in any and every area you might be interested in. There are many books about the many uses of essential oils, or you can Google an essential oil tutorial and get some excellent videos on the subject. Now, did you all get one of these little packages today? If you have, I'd like to take that out right now. I thought you might enjoy experiencing an essential oil as well as just hearing about them. So, for you, my distinguished guest, I have selected peppermint. I kind of squished mine earlier, so I'm just going to come out right um, what I'd like you to do is take, take this little veggie cap. You can take the top off of it, you can see it, and just smell it. This is uh, peppermint, which is, comes from the leaves of the peppermint plant, and which is hard, uh, harvested in its ideal region of the USA Pacific Northwest. This is made in America, folks. Now, if you can, pour a little drop in the palm of your hand and rub your hands together. Then I want you to make a fist, kind of like this, and I want you to just inhale real deep if you can, like this. You feel that? Did you, see, you feel that air that going into your lungs? That is a natural, that is a natural inhaler. And what that has done is just made opened up your airways and made your breathing a little easier. Now you have just experienced this oil both topically and aromatically. For those of you who are brave enough, you can even taste this oil as well. It is safe to take internally. And I know many people who take it to freshen their breath and to ease of occasional tummy disorders. There's just one more thing I'd like to say before I finish. I wholeheartedly recommend that you do your homework before you invest in essential oils. There are some very, very reputable companies that can supply you with 100% CPTG, Certified Pure Therapeutic Grade Essential Oils. <coughs> but I caution you to beware of essential oils that claim to be 100%, but could be adulterated with a mixture of fillers of many different kinds. Good essential oils are a bit more expensive, but they are worth the price. Essential oils are gifts of the earth, and they're meant to be appreciated and respected. I hope you'll give them a try. And I hope that the experience will broaden your world and bring you joy and unexpected pleasures. Thank you. I heard somebody coughing out there. I hope it wasn't in the at all. It smells good in here. <laughs> Uh, how did you get involved?
involved in this? Or has it been a, something you've been doing for many, many years? Or? Oh, I've been doing it for three years, and I actually got bullied into it. Um, <laughs> my girlfriend was in oils, and she just wanted me, she just kept bugging me. She said, well, sorry, I'll buy the oils, just shut up. <laughs> anyway, um, so I got the oils, and I started playing with them. And then um, a friend of mine had gotten shingles, and she made a spray with the essential oils, and it completely helped her with that situation. And I thought, you know what, maybe I should be paying more attention. So I started studying more and um, started learning that there really was a lot to that, and that kind of got me on the road to that. It's been about three years. Somebody behind, was it you, Caroline? Somebody yes, has right. a baby. She's right here. Hi. 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 Um, I don't have children. Well, I do. They're furry, and they have four legs and dogs. <laughs> <laughs> have, I've had numerous, and they're all rescues, and I've had dogs with anxiety, and I've had dogs with other issues. Can essential oils help? Oh, absolutely. Yes. They, use it, they use it in the animal abuse cases. Uh, but you have to be careful with dogs and cats because you can't use all the oils on them. But a perfect go-to oil for the animals is lavender. Okay. And you don't put it directly on them, of course. Um, what you want to do is put some in your palm of your hand and rub it together and pet them. Okay. And then you can also diffuse. There's certain uh, blends of that will, will bring down anxiety. Uh, just by diffusing, they can breathe that safely in the air. Um, but with the uh, kitty litter thing, every time the kitty goes in the box, she gets a little bit of that on her paws, and then they let that they, that dictate that internally. But it, it, lavender is the safest one, and it's a very calming, soothing oil. So, like, if it was going to be a tornado watch or thunderstorm, where they were going to just start diffusing the lavender, <laughs> diffuse lavender, you know, hook at them, and it also makes it smell good too. Because yeah. sometimes when dogs get a little stinky, but you can use that on dogs as well as cats. Dogs and cats, yes. Lavender is the, is the one oil that you can use on your pets pretty uh, liberally. I mean, not liberally, you don't want anything to use any liberally. But that's the one oil because the other oils, it just depends on the animal. So you, you just want to start there. Because I'm not my horse with lavender oil and water. Mm -hmm. And also use lemon oil. So is that bad for pets, lemon oil? No, not at all. Lemon is a purifier. So if you and if you have a diffuser, if you're diffusing lemon and lavender, it's calming, soothing, and cleaning. So you get like two for one. Yeah, that sounds good. I was mocked with it, so it smells like lavender. Yeah, yes, it is, and it's also just it does the work for um for for the you know disinfecting for germs too. So it's very very good. And some like one of my girlfriends takes um, when you buy produce from the store, she'll take a drop of lemon oil, and put it in a bowl, and then put her produce in there, and then wait a couple of minutes to stir it around and pull them out. And now they've all been cleaned, and you look on the bottom of the bowl, there's all this residue. Oh man, I didn't know that. <laughs> I guess I'm going to start doing that now, so. Anything else? Over here. Oh. Oh, will any of the websites tell you which oils are appropriate for animals and which are not? Yeah, actually, there are. If you can go on, there is a, um, I think there's a book called Spoil spool oil your pet um, they do have books that you can read just on the oils and how to use them with your animals and i would recommend you get that and that that will tell you it'll it'll give you blends on how if they have ticks or fleas and just all kinds of information for your pets and they and they love it they absolutely love it you know that was very because you use it on your pets and that's going to add that you have websites listed in the program yes Thank you. Bob Bowen, also may be new to many of you, but he has been a professor at Truett McConnell University for five years. He has director of the Laboratory of Applied and Exercise Endocrinology there. Bob is on the cutting edge of some fascinating research that will interest all of us. So imagine this scenario. Doctor walks into an exam room with several concerns. High blood pressure, elevated LDLs, reduced HDLs, and elevated body mass. 
He prescribes corrective action for each of the concerns, including a medication to control blood pressure and a change in diet to reduce caloric consumption and increase fiber content. His goal was to reduce the risks of heart disease, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and certain types of cancer, among other things. The doctor's plan to remedy all of the listed health disparities was focused on either masking the underlying effect with drugs or to attack the excessive body mass. I sat quietly staring back at my doctor. Perhaps you've been in a similar situation sitting in an exam. Unfortunately, I was 27 years old at the time, uh, and it would seem that I was becoming just another statistic, just another American at a higher risk for all causes of mortality, uh, slowly fading into perpetual illness. This doctor, like many other doctors uh, around the world, primary care physicians, uh, they're primed by the exciting world of the obesity epidemic. The epidemic shows up on the evening news, in the blogosphere, and in popular media constantly. The doctor's medical training has been ripe with how excessive body mass is causing our society to crumble. The medical community, primary through psychological and pharmacological intervention, eat different foods, change your habits, take a pill, was expected to save humanity from the obesity epidemic. The only problem with the diagnosis is it was utterly wrong. The issue had nothing to do with body mass, and as a young PhD student in biology, I was already trying to better, better understand the correct answer. The vernacular of the obesity epidemic has its roots in a 1985 survey conducted by the Center for Disease Control. The Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey has been used to collect state-level body mass data every year for the last 31 years. And now we are apparently more likely to be overweight or obese than we are to be normal weight, more likely to be diseased than we are to be healthy. With time, the rate of obesity has ever increased. By 2010, the original blue tone colors, representing lower percentages of the population, have given way to orange and yellow colors, representing even higher rates of obesity. All the states now have at least a 20% population at the obese category or within the obese category. The method of uh, the survey was changed slightly in 2011, but the trends are the same. And in the last year of survey completion, which was 2014, only five states had an obesity prevalence between 20 and 25%. Uh, 20 and 25%. Most of the states were actually now pushing 30%. And so the situation really does look desperate. But it gets even worse. The portion of a population that is considered to be obese or overweight is now estimated at 60% in many of our states. And it's not just a US phenomenon. The United States data reflects many other countries, countries in Africa, the Middle East, Europe, Oceania. All of these countries have populations with obesity greater than 20%. And some cultural groups are even reaching upwards of 90% or more. Collectively, this is the reason we are living in the age of the obesity epidemic. Scared to face reality, right? But there is a major problem with the obesity epidemic paradigm. The term epidemic indicates that obesity is a widespread disease condition affecting a large sector of a given population. And certainly, obesity is widespread. And it does occur in a large portion of our global population. Although the condition can exasperate medical issues. It is not itself a disease-causing agent. Rather, it is a symptom of a much more prevalent, yet seldom talked about epidemic known as the physical inactivity epidemic. Data collected from medical records on body mass, activity status, and disease prevalence clearly show that the risk for all kinds of disease and death is obliterated in individuals who obtain higher levels of fitness through physical activity. It is much better to be obese and physically active than to be normal weight and physically inactive. You are twice as likely to fall victim to a variety of diseases and to die from these conditions when you're inactive. Physical activity and its protective benefits go beyond just preventing disease to also inhibiting the adverse effects of other poor choices. In a classic scientific study of the London bus system in the 1950s, researchers discovered vastly different health outcomes and rates of disease in two types of transportation workers who were working on double-decker buses. The drivers 
and the conductors. The drivers smoked, they ate an unhealthy diet, they drank alcohol, but, uh, and they sat all day long driving the bus. The conductors smoked, ate an unhealthy diet, drank alcohol, but would walk up and down the stairs and the aisles of the double-decker bus collecting the fare. The rates of disease, or really the lack of disease, in the conductors was astronomically different than the drivers. The only difference in lifestyle was that the, the physical activity that was required for each individual to, uh, to fully complete their job responsibilities. What is really interesting is that the positive effects of physical activity are not limited just to health outcomes. Children who engage in routine physical activity are uh, much more likely to have a high level of income in their adult life. We are better able to manage daily stress, have better personal relationships, and we build stronger communities. Somewhat ironically, I'm probably not telling you too much you don't already know. You may have even made a New Year's resolution to fix your exercise habits, or perhaps you have a gym membership that goes primarily unused. So why, in general, are we so inactive? Currently, it is estimated that only about 3 to 5% of the U.S. population meets the minimum recommended amount of moderate and vigorous physical activity. We all know what to do, so why is it so dang hard to do it, to get out and to move? Primarily, there have been three reasons given for the lack of physical activity participation in the United States. We're simply just too lazy. Two, we are simply just too busy. Or three, we have a broken biological drive. So the first explanation can be easily refuted with data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Looking at the American Time Use Survey, this illustrates that during adult life, 25 to 54 years of age, Americans average about 2.5 or more hours a day in what's known as leisure time activity. Most of this is actually spent watching TV. If you must watch TV, why not put a TV in front of a treadmill? Overall, as a culture, we're not too busy. Most everybody can find time to participate in some sort of moderate to vigorous physical activity. The second explanation is also easily refuted by simply observing the 100 years of failure in psychology, behavioral science, and sociology to reverse the ever-increasing rate of physical activity in many different human populations. When the trans theoretical model of behavior change is employed to physical activity behaviors, it fails to elicit any positive effects, uh, at least lasting positive effects. The case in point is the hit uh, TV show, uh, ABC TV show, The Biggest Loser. Contestants on this show typically lose large amounts of body mass, they change their dietary habits, and they increase their overall physical activity during the show. Only to revert back to lower physical activity levels, resulting in increased body mass and decreased metabolic rate in the years following the show. The stringencies that are experienced during filming don't readily translate into, a, uh, into an effective um, reduction in, in body mass and increase in physical activity in the real world. So the major issue with the first two explanations for the low physical activity that we uh, have in the United States is by and large, they ignore the growing knowledge that this is truly a biologically driven behavior. If the biological system is broken, the individual defaults to a couch potato condition. Thus, if we can uncover the biological drivers of physical activity, we have a fighting chance to delineate the behavior successfully. And maybe we can all biologically become frantic bananas and begin to gain the health benefits of moving. So any behavior can really be broken down into two major factors, a biological drive and an environmental pressure. The biological drive can be modeled as a large intertwined network that can include, among other things, genetic controls, chemical inter interactions, physiological mechanisms, uh, and, and the like. The environmental pressure, on the other hand, relates to the external influences, diet, parental influences, environmental exposure. The level of influence both factors have varies between behaviors. In terms of physical activity behavior, several studies have shown that the biological component is highly influential. Ongoing studies from labs around the country, including Truett McConnell University, right here in White County, are investigating a variety of different biological mechanisms, from genetic controls to endocrine influences over the behavior. Studies in my lab at TMU have been specifically looking at the effects of the sex hormones, 
and how they affect physical activity. We have been using mus musculus, or the house mouse, as a model organism. This particular strain or type of house mouse is called a C57 black 6J. And they are impressive when it comes to physical activity. When they're provided an in cage running mill, a C57 black 6J mouse will run roughly 8 to 12 kilometers in an 8 to 9 hour period, all in the dark. And yes, it's okay to admit these mice are better athletes than you are. These mice are better athletes than everybody. When we eliminate the internal sources of the sex hormones, both estrogen and testosterone, the mice do something quite interesting. Well, actually, they don't do anything at all. And that's really interesting. They become total couch potatoes, using the running wheel more frequently as a toilet than as an activity device. In other words, we have created a model where we have the ability to induce physical inactivity. If we provide sex hormone, either sex hormone to either sex, physical activity is reinvigorated. The ability to turn physical activity on and off in mice is incredibly powerful. Current work using this model is hoping to evaluate the underlying cellular and molecular mechanisms that facilitate higher levels of physical activity. To date, we have been interested in two physiological areas of the body, the brain and the skeletal muscle. We are interested in the brain because it's possible that the observ observable reductions in physical activity levels are related to a change in motivation or the desire to be physically active. We are interested in the skeletal muscle, in particular muscles used in, uh, in running from the limbs, because it's possible that the observable reductions in physical activity are related to the animal's overall ability to perform activity. Thus far, we have been focusing brain physiology studies on a gene that helps to move dopamine around the hypothalamus. The gene, simply known as VMAP2, is involved in moving dopamine into little membrane-bound packets called vesicles. The mice that can efficiently shuttle dopamine around neurons in the brain using these vesicles may more efficiently establish a favorable brain environment that promotes physical activity. In other words, the sex hormones may turn VMAT2 function on and off, resulting in the ability to create or diminish the correct brain conditions to be motivated to perform activity. Although VMAT2 has been shown by others to result in changes to physical activity, the link to the sex hormones is an ongoing study, and more data really is needed. In terms of skeletal muscle physiology, we have been focusing, focusing our attention on a gene that helps regulate calcium levels in the skeletal muscle. It's called Cal sequestrin 1. Calcium is everything in muscle physiology. Huge alterations in calcium levels are required for the muscle to undergo efficient contraction. An organism that can quickly move calcium into the cell for contraction and out of the cell for relaxation will produce efficient muscle movements. An organism that does not do this as well will be limited in their ability to perform physical activity for prolonged periods of time. This calcium handling gene is known to be associated with physical activity performance, but currently appears to be limited in, the, in terms of sex hormone regulation, and we've begun to explore some other re potential regulatory targets. We really have a long way to go towards understanding the regulation of physical activity, especially in humans. But please know that we're working on it, working to make life more active and healthy. In the meantime, please stand up, get out, and move. It's extremely good for you. Thank you. Pretty cool to find out what's going on over there at Truett McConnell. <laughs> So, questions? Does this mean um, that when the production of sex hormones slows down in the body, you won't want to exercise, or what does that mean? There's actually experimental evidence out of the University of Colorado that has shown that they've experimentally reduced the production of the hormones from the posterior or from the uh, pituitary gland that control the release of the, uh, the sex hormones. And after about three months, what they find is a pretty noticeable reduction in physical activity. Well, <laughs> 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 <laughs>
she had, she asked, could we blame being couch potatoes on motivation? <laughs> Certainly you could. <laughs> Really what we're trying to do is we want to look at that, that biological network. And it's an extremely complex network for any behavior. And uh, we want to begin to find what are those therapeutic areas? What are the targets that we can potentially utilize that could enhance physical activity levels? So yeah, you may be able to blame your genes, but let's figure out how to control those genes a little differently and be able to increase physical activity levels to gain those benefits. So are you trying to figure that out? That's what we've been working on, and there's, there's a, a small group of other labs around the United States from East Coast to West Coast that are, are doing similar, similar things to what we're doing here at Truett, um, just from a slightly different angle, looking at genetic controls or the neurochemistry. Um, but yeah, the hope is, is that we'll find a, a, some important some putative genes that will be involved in regulating physical activity. And what the next question is after that, we haven't really begun to think about that. Is it giving an injection? Maybe, maybe not. Really, we just want to find out the, the mechanisms that are driving the behavior right now. Um, two parts to this. One, you just explain whether when you get old, we get fat. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, I mean, I would think that part of the reason for wanting to know this is we're living longer as a population. So we, we want to be as healthy as we can as long as we can. But the other part of that is how do the sex hormones affect young people? Because there's an obesity epidemic with younger people. Yeah. Um, so, so let me take that first question and um, tell you a little bit about how much money we spend as a culture on healthcare care um, related to physical inactivity. It's about four, $400 billion a year. That's a huge chunk of change. So. Um, yeah, I mean, as we, as we age and we're needing uh, care longer and longer in life, it just simply is going to cost more and more. And so if we can begin to utilize a relatively inexpensive form of medicine known as exercise, it's going to reduce those costs, or at least curtail them some. Now, the second question, the, the, the young, um, that's really interesting. Uh, and, and there's actually a researcher at Michigan State who's looking at pediatric exercise uh, right now, and uh, the reason that that's occurring, we're not entirely sure. Uh, some people have put forward the hypothesis that it could be involved with uh, endocrine disruptors that show up in plastics and, and things like that. Uh, I think the jury's still a little bit out on that. There's been a couple of studies that have come out, and the, the dosage that's needed from something like the spinal A or one of the other plasticizers is pretty astronomically high. It's a lot higher than what you're naturally exposed to. So it could be playing a part, but I'm not sure that it's the entire question. Other folks have put forward the idea that we've changed our diet a lot. Um, again, there, uh, some concerns that I have with that is we actually really haven't changed the cons calorie consumption in our diets over the last 100 years. Most people say, oh, we're eating way more food, and it's only about 27 calories a day, which is about three, it's about three pounds of weight, uh, weight gain in, in a one-year period. So um, what's going on in that in the pediatric population, um, I'm hoping becomes one of those things that we start to fund scientifically more frequently. Most of the time, we spend it on the end of life. People who are in their, in their final, final years is where we spend a lot of our money. And there's nothing wrong with that. But because of the changes, higher rates of diabetes, what we used to call adult diabetes, or adult onset diabetes, occurring much more frequently in, in, in children now as well. Those are great scientific questions. And then we'll grow up to be able to take care of us. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I noticed about, you know, if you ever look at pictures of World War II or um, how pre war wars were, and I know we were in the Depression, but even post war wars, you, if you look at the pictures of people, they're thin. Every single one of them, they're, they're fit and they're, and they're more physically active. People just did more with, in their jobs than we do, just physically, if they were more. So that may have a lot to do with it as well. I mean, that's what you're saying, basically. Yeah, so, but why have we departed? I mean, we get rid of the need to be out in a farmer's field, or we get rid of the need to, to, to push a lawnmower. Why don't we reciprocate with 
physical activity. I mean, we have cities that are walkable, and they're some of the worst in terms of obesity and, and disease. Charlotte, North Carolina is one of the top-rated walkable cities, and it's also one of the most disease-prone. So there's a disconnect between making our cities more walkable, making our environment something that is conducive for physical activity. So there's this biological component. And, and the, it, it, there is a disconnect. And, and when we look at the, the biological versus the environmental, the classic way that they've looked at it out of the genetics field is uh, the, the genotype or the genetics plus the environment, the environmental pressure equals the behavior. And you've got those two, those two things that you're looking at. And, and you can basically parse out which component has a higher influence. Obviously, it's going to add up to 100%, right? So it could be a 50-50 in terms of the biology and physical activity, their most estimates are, are well above 50%. And that's a huge biological component. Most behaviors that we think of as being biological, biologically driven hair color and things like that are actually somewhat lower than physical activity. And what about fast food consumption? It certainly could be. Um, but again, just our, our caloric consumption uh, has not really changed all that much. Uh, we may be relying more on those um, fast food meals, um, but one of the things that's really interesting is, is even individuals who consume, you know, what's been now classically deemed a Western culture diet, if they incorporate activity, they still have lower levels of, uh, that, that's one of those bad choices that can, that can be mediated or moderated by physical activity levels. Well, I'm still kind of surprised you know, that you're saying that we're not actually Taking in more calories or eating more than you used to. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, especially if you eat out, then you eat cheaper than you get. I don't know. I'm not seeing this. I, I mean, I am seeing the amount that people eat. And I think it's more than uh, they would in the past or more than they do in other countries. I know French people come here and immediately uh, they put on 30 or 40 pounds. But you, I'm sure if you get the figures, that's what you, it shows. Yeah, the, the epidemiologist and one of the, the most prominent epidemiologists here in the country that looks at uh, physical activity behavior and food behavior is Steve Blair at the University of South Carolina. And um, the, the numbers that, so there's two ways that you can look at food behavior, consumption behavior. One is to journal, write down everything that you consume. The other way is to do a, what's called a recall survey. And you go up to an individual and, like, what have you eaten for the last 10 days? And he has to tell me everything that he's eating. Of course, our, our memory is not that good. So a lot of the studies that show higher levels of caloric consumption come from those recall surveys. When we have food journaling done, when, when the individual writes down everything that they consume as they consume it, it drastically reduces the the consumption. Because when they have to do that, they stop eating. <laughs> That's possible, um, but when they observe it and, and have an uh, experiment, uh, experiment record and do it incognito, I guess you would say, the results are the same. So I'm not sold that we're eating a whole lot more food. At least that's what the science, my interpretation of the science really shows. And I know, yeah, I agree. You go out to eat and you go to the Olive Garden, it's a huge meal, and you come home and wish you hadn't eaten it. But um, we're not eating out constantly as a culture for the most part. Um, well, I've even been in a waffle house. <laughs> 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 uh, now, I, think, I think it might be time uh, to cut this short. <laughs>